Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tom Holmberg. I'm, I'm really excited to share the virtual stage with the three panelists we have today. The topic of our discussion is resilience in the energy transition, and our panelists really cover the waterfront in terms of viewpoints. We have a representative from the Oilfield Services Company who will address what resilience means in terms of her company, her industry, and the relevant stakeholders. We have a big four consultant who will discuss the role data and digitalization will play, in my view, causing some disruption uh, uh, quite independently of the events of 2020 uh, as it prompts evolution of the energy industry. Uh, and we have an attorney and academic who studies, among other things, the global energy markets and their supply chains. The first panelist is Lise Rodionov, who's the global director for sustainability at Schlumberger. Lise has spent 27 years at Schlumberger in a variety of roles and locations around the world, including Houston, Scotland, Trinidad, Venezuela, and Alaska. Since May 2019, she's been the global director for sustainability, looking after both social and environmental sustainability. Prior to that, she was president of Schlumberger's onshore business in the US and Canada for all business lines outside uh, of completions. Since relocating back to Houston, she's also served as a global account director and human resource director for the production group. She was also the general manager for Schlumberger Alaska. In 2019, she was honored by Heart Energy as one of the 25 most influential women in energy. She's from the Houston area and attended Rice University earning a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Management and an MBA in Finance. Our next panelist is Deborah Byers, who serves as EY's American industry leader and also America's oil and gas leader. She's a member of the America's Markets Executive Committee and leads EY's industry markets leaders across the Americas region. Her core responsibilities include setting strategic growth role, uh, goals informed by economic and industry trends in each of the key market sectors, advising the EY executive board to shape near-term and long-term investment decisions on resources and technology solutions, and recruiting and developing leadership talent for client servicing teams. Deborah is a member of the AICPA and Texas Society of CPAs and is licensed in Texas. She's also on the board of directors of the Baker Ripley Advisory Council, member for the Bilateral Chamber, and was previously a board member of the United Way and Greater Houston Partnership. Deborah received a Bachelor's of Business Administration and Accounting from Baylor University. Our final panelist is Gabe Collins. Gabe is the Baker Botts Fellow in Energy and Environmental Regulatory Affairs at Rice University's Baker Institute. He was previously an Associate Attorney at Baker Hostelner and is the co-founder of the China Signpost and Analysis Portal. Gabe has worked in the Department of Defense as a China analyst and as a private sector global commodity researcher, offering more than 100 commodity analysis reports, both for private clients and for publication. His research portfolio is global. His work currently focuses on legal, environmental, and economic issues relating to water, including the food, water, energy nexus, as well as unconventional oil and gas development and the intersection between global commodity markets and a range of environmental, legal, and national security issues. His analysis draws from a broad swath of geospatial and other data streams and often incorporates insights from sources in Chinese, Russian, and Spanish. Gabe received his BA from Princeton University and a JD from the University of Michigan Law School. He's licensed to practice law in Texas. With that, I will turn the mic over to Lise to kick off her initial remarks. Thank you, the, the unmuting and time test. I. Um, as Tom mentioned, I moved into this role in um, corporate in May last year, looking after sustainability. But as he said, most of my career at Schlumberger has been on the business side. So I would say, you know, my lens or perspective for the conversation is the operational one. And I spend most of my day-to-day -day time figuring out how to connect sustainability to business and and how we incorporate the sustainability priority alongside, you know, all the other priorities that we have. When I was asked to be on the panel, I, I thought about, you know, the title Resilience in Energy Transition and what that meant to me. And, you know, I would say I see a corporate perspective and a, a societal perspective, if you will. So if I just briefly take each in turn from the corporate perspective, you know, you have the resilience of the industry, ours and others, but for the sake of our discussion, um, you know, for ours, that it evolves through the shift in energy mix and remains a, a significant contributor to energy access. 
um, you have resilience of the companies in the industry and the, the relevance of our strategies so that the actions we're taking continue to drive progress towards sustainability ambitions, even as those ambitions change, and they will, because you know we're talking about a, a time scale of, of decades. And then it's also the resilience of the actions themselves, of, of their longevity. Um, you know, they really can't be discrete projects that need incubating or or which are dependent on individuals, uh, people, individual people, individual companies, uh, individual associations, but instead are, are innovative changes really at the, the system level. And I think the main challenge with resilience from the corporate perspective is the uncertainty of the landscape of what the energy mix, energy transition will be um, decades from now and and really the pace and the path to that mix as well as the very perspectives on what that pace and path should look like. Um, for resilience and energy transition from the societal lens, for me, it's ensuring that the path to the ambitions in this space, and, and that's whether you know you're at the the global GHG requirement level, the you know to country specific energy transition priorities, to company ambitions, to you know even individual lifestyle choices. It's ensuring that the how we get there is done in a way that doesn't just consider the environmental priority, but also the financial one and, and the human one. You know, what is the impact on society of this action, on GDP, on shareholder value, uh, on quality of life? And, you know, not about um, blindly prioritizing one over the other, but instead finding that sweet spot between return on environmental, financial, and human capital. And, and fundamentally believing that they aren't mutually exclusive, but also recognizing that there are trade-offs. Um, and the main challenge in that space is that those trade-offs won't be visible to individual decision makers without you know, frequent, um, transparent, agenda agnostic dialogue between decision makers across the various stakeholder groups. Um, in the end, and, and if you've heard me speak on this topic uh, recently, you, you may have heard me hear this say this before, but I really see energy transition as an opportunity uh, for doing things differently, for innovation, for being strategic. And I think that companies that can transparently, ambitiously, and empathetically articulate and execute a strategy that connects to stakeholders and you know finds that sweet spot between the three kinds of capital will have a competitive uh, advantage and will end up being resilient. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of companies in our industry that have been around a really long time and evolve with changing expectations around license to operate. And, you know, I believe collectively as an industry that we're absolutely capable uh, and committed uh, to continuing to do that through energy transition. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for including me on the panel and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, thank you, Lise. Deborah? Yeah, no, those are uh, great comments and I couldn't agree more with the framing that Lise has set out. And, and so I, I just really wanted to share some some information, um, which I think is a challenge, but also an opportunity for the industry. As Lee said, you know, transparency is gonna be really important as you think about being resilient through uh, what the upcoming energy transition or transformation. And in order to have that transparency, there's two, two things that are really critical. One is a standard way to measure it, whether you're trying to measure return on, on capital deployed, whether you're trying to measure um, emissions, you know, there has to be a standard that everyone sort of abides to, so you standardize that. And, the, and then secondly, you've got to have the data in a form that is trusted. And so this is going to be the, really the next big challenge, but the good news is there's a lot of technology that's out there. The challenge is how do you scale it and integrate it in the current operating system? So in June of this year, right in the middle of everything that was happening with the pandemic, um, we went out and did a survey that was a follow-up to a survey around digital um, digital activation, digital investment in the, oil, in, in the oil and gas industry in 2018. We did it again in 2020. And it's interesting what has changed. And part of it definitely resonated that, yes, low oil price, which hit us before the, the pandemic, 
accelerated the ongoing investment and need to get digital integrated and the trans digital transformation really off and running and scaled. But then the pandemic kind of came and really accentuated that. So I think you hear that in all the sectors, in all the sectors that I, I, I'm speaking to, certainly, um, you know, the, the mega trends that were existing around digital transformation and adoption of digital, whether you're talking about online shopping, which is the one everyone knows about, but things like uh, telehealth, which was really struggled with adoption, things like remote work, we're all remotely working, we're having this discussion remotely. And, and, and those things have accelerated with the pandemic. And it, it really, the way I kind of step back and look at it is it gives you like a real world experiment of, hey, let's take this digital technology, let's try it, and it actually worked. Now, how do we integrate that and get the real benefit, the promise that digital has, has you know, shown us over the last few years? So let me just quickly go through the survey and then you know, later this may raise some questions. And these, this is just a, a very uh, high level snapshot of some of our findings. And I would bucket the findings sort of in three areas. One is that everyone wants to, to invest in digital. You see that on this slide, that digital technologies have been widely adopted but they've not been fully integrated. And that means they haven't, your, your base infrastructure and the way you're operating is still not fully adapted to the technologies that are out there. So we don't really need like net new technology so much as being able to scale machine learning, um, you know, predictive analytics, et cetera, and get that embedded in the operational infrastructure so that you can really get the, uh, the benefit of, of the digital transformation. Secondly, the barriers are really organizationally, which I just mentioned. But then, how do you reskill, especially right now, where you know not only do we have this challenge of you know oversupply, the demand destruction, which has led to you know frankly job losses and a perception that the industry itself has. But then, how do you reskill and att attract the talent? Which there's an, uh, another uh, slide that I'll show you where the biggest gap are in the areas where. Um, the biggest skill gap at the companies are in the areas where you're going to have to compete with, you know, industries in the tech space and, and the commerce space that are going to be more attractive to some of the younger folk. And, and, and then the third big barrier is you got to move fast. And that is a tough thing to do when capital is scarce. This is an investment that could be in multiple, multiple millions of dollars to transform a company. And you're at a, you're at a point in time, you got to take that leap can you realize the return on that kind of investment? So that's, that's really the challenge. Everyone agrees it needs to be done. Um, and, and, and I will share for anybody that wants it, a deeper uh, PDF file that has all the results. And the only reason I want you to look at this is just, if you look at you know the remote monitoring, all of that, so currently using, but the areas that as you go down, you know the newer technologies, edge com computing, which is really starting to take off next generation, uh, enterprise resource planning, blockchain, um, chatbots, use of virtual and augmented reality. That's sort of the future. That's also the area where you have the most to go. Um, and then this, this shows the, the maturity uh, and the skills gap. And I think it really kind of hits, hits home that what they are looking for, 89%, for example, are looking for analytical thinking innovation skills that need to increase. And yet that's the biggest gap that, that companies see. And so this is a, a, a nice bubble chart that accentuates that. So, you know, in the core areas, engineering, cybersecurity, um, the companies pretty much got a handle on it. But if you think about data analytics, you think back to uh, Lisa's opening comments, as well as, you know, a lot of conversation around, you got to get to that end customer. It's more than just engaging with your investor base and engaging with the government and engaging B2B. Now you got to understand what the customer is also thinking at the end of this as they become a more and more important stakeholder in this. Um, that requires data in a much larger and much more you know voluminous way than we've ever had before. And, and you know, this is going to be a struggle. So you see data analytics, 91% say that it's critically important, yet only 32% believe that they have that maturity. And, and that's the same in data science. So you, what we have always said is you really can't have a full digital transformation without having the data transformation. 
So this is this was a really you know kind of affirming uh, a lot of of what we we're thinking. And then and then the third point being that closing the skill gap has been very fragmented. So the entire you know people talent the talent. Uh, strategy is going to be critical because this is where it's not just a matter of putting a lot of people through some digital learning. It's also about changing the organizational behavior and the and the and the workforce stack that you have. And and for um, again, just highlighting that the barriers that the respondents do see is is very much around human and organizational, not technological. So I'm going to just stop there, and I know that uh, we, we can kind of refer back to these, but. It, it, without a without core digital and data transformation, it's really going to be difficult to be competitive and go uh, to that next generation of you know what is the next energy system, what is the the growth strategy for the, for the industry. Thanks, Deborah. That's that's really fascinating, and I look forward to coming back uh, for more discussion uh, after our next uh, presenter, uh, Gabe. Floor is yours. Gabe, are you there? Oh, sorry. While we're waiting for Gabe, uh, let's go to a uh, an audience question. Uh, uh, somebody asked, "What what does the panel think the implications of the energy transition will be on the uh, onshore offshore oil and gas industry, and how much uh, will that part of the sector shrink?" Lee's endeavor. Do you have any views on that? Lee's, you want to go first? I can, I, can, first. I can certainly comment. Sure. Okay. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think first, as a general comment, it, for any aspect of the industry, there's always the competition for capital, especially, um, you know, with customers that have a portfolio intentionally that's broad. So how those lifting costs compare with other alternatives inside that company for, for uh, return um, certainly will we'll factor in. But I think maybe I'll have take a step like at a, at Level, I think it, it comes down to maybe the question of, with respect to transition, there's focusing on ESG and there's transition, right? And they are different things. So, um, you know, focusing on ESG is kind of a ticket to the dance increasingly more and companies are going, whether they're in offshore oil and gas or in any other you know, space, they're gonna have to increasingly focus on ESG to get access to capital. And um, so, like I said, that's kind of, we'll see everybody have to do that. But you look at any estimate of the energy mix decades down the road and, you know, the EIA one is still 2040, 45 to 50% is oil and gas. So um, there will be companies that decide not to transition, still focus on ESG, but not shift their portfolio mix because there is still opportunity um, and demand associated with meeting, you know, that, that energy demand. So uh, it, what it will mean though, uh, you know, again, I think that it started with the, the investment on the unconventional side is, is that drove lifting costs down across the board as well as where commodity prices are today. The, the cost to, you know, get the energy out of the ground has, uh, is really, is constantly you know, had been under pressure over the last several years. So, does that answer the question? Uh, sure, sure. Deborah, do you have any follow up thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are, there are two things. One, um, the sector is going to be capital starved, and so I think it's actually a, a bit of a good thing at this point because you look at you got to separate onshore and offshore, obviously. And, and so it's difficult to see how offshore can consolidate more, but 
that probably will happen. Though there, there's some players that uh, that I think will you'll see consolidation. But right now they got to continue to work through the fact that you know capital is not going to be available like it was in the past. So that will force a consolidation at least on the onshore side. So you won't see you know, what we saw in 2014 and 2015, where there was a lot of money coming in and when there was an upsurge in production and, you know, uh, the economics look good, then you had a lot of big, uh, you know, a lot of private capital, for example, come in and you, you had teams pop up all over the place. So I think there will be a consolidation just because of the fact that the capital won't be there. Um, and, and despite the fact that things will definitely come back and demand will be there for hydrocarbons, you know, it is, um, it's need that capacity is going to come out in both, on both the onshore and the offshore side. But I do think that um, to the point of, of new technologies, so clean energy technology is something what, and I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, wind and solar, there's, you know, technologies to operate most efficiently, you know, and making sure that if you're doing a workover, you've got the most efficient, um, you know, processes in place and, and the, you know, methane emissions is going to be a huge thing, CCS. So I think these kind of clean energy technologies, the, the service companies have that kind of capability to really scale that up to meet the, the challenge that's coming up as well. So there's alternative, you know, new markets, if you will, that I think will grow. Thanks. I, I think we have Gabe back on the line, speaking of Can technologies. Uh, I think he's with us. Do you, Dave, are you do you do, do you have me? Let, let me make sure you can hear me here before I launch. Yes. Okay, good. So I'm actually going to riff a little bit off of the uh, capital starvation theme. I apologize for the disruption there. Not sure what it was, but I think this uh, first question actually tees things up very nicely. I'm going to look give you three takeaways here. I'll post the full list to ten after we're done. The first one here, I think, looks at this through a very Texan lens, and it uses the analogy of cattle and hamburgers. I think what we've seen over the last few years here is cattle have really fallen out of favor, and cattle in this case basically means the upstream business, as well as some of the uh, downstream uses of carbon-intensive energy sources. I think one of the key things that we need to think about is it's probably not possible to eliminate cattle, aka fossil fuels, in the types of timetables that are imagined, for instance, uh, in the Green New Deal, and yet still expect to have hamburgers, which in this case would be accessible and affordable energy. And I think it's really important to imagine change as something that is really an incremental process uh, if we want it to be sustainable. I think certainly various subsidies and policy measures can shift these time frames, but there's some real scale and legacy impacts that we have to think about. For instance, selling a million electric vehicles a year is a great technological accomplishment, but if you have a, a vehicle fee, uh, fleet of a billion, then you may not necessarily be making the kind of impact that you'd want to see. Uh, I think something else that has very much been at the forefront of some of the research I'm working on is should not assume a post-pandemic green revival. And in particular, we have three global energy titans who are disproportionately driving a lot of what's happening in the world energy space. And those are China, India, and the United States. And there's a real risk that in the wake of COVID-19 with more burdened uh, public balance sheets, for instance, that you actually see a doubling down on legacy fuels. And just to kind of put these, uh, the scale of these three jurisdictions in perspective, they accounted for nearly half of the world's primary energy consumption last year, according to the BP Statistical Review. And between 2010 and 2019, they drove almost two thirds of global net growth in energy use period for primary energy. And it was a pattern that was repeated uh, across most major energy sources, even including renewables. And then the final point uh, I think that's very important to consider here is how similar the processes of divestment and bankruptcy are to each other. And what I mean by this is 
assets are not taken out of play or out of production. You simply have a change in management teams. And I'll give a concrete example is one of the things we've seen from pressure on oil sands holdings by some of the majors, uh, including Shell and ConocoPhillips, is we see a sell-down ecosystem emerge where you get companies like Canadian Natural Resources that take these assets on and rather view than viewing them as ESG liabilities, they view them as long life producing assets that can still yield free cash flow at $30 a barrel. And I think we're going to see more and more of these types of dynamics emerge as certain operators come under more investor pressure and others take a, re a view that carbon will be in the system longer than we probably like and that during that that interregnum during that time period there will be real opportunities to generate returns and i think you know we're headed into a very interesting space here i'm extremely optimistic about technology i think we have a lot of the building blocks in place to leave a better world to our children when it comes to some of these uh, big energy issues but you know we're gonna have to really think in a a realistic and forward-looking way about the risks and approach things proactively so that we're not suddenly hit in the face by a California blackout on steroids. That's really interesting, Dave. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, I want to follow up to you with a question uh, based upon something you said, which is that given the possibility of overburdened balance sheets, you might see a doubling down on traditional energy sources. Um, that seems to indicate to me that you think that that, that uh, progress innovation uh, is, is likely or would be likely to be spurned by government um, uh, investment and so forth. Uh, do you see any path forward, you know, uh, perhaps by governments uh, imposing other incentives like carbon taxes or a, a price on carbon to, to uh, cause uh, industry itself to develop those technologies and, and, and advance advance things like uh, green hydrogen or carbon capture or other other their sources of energy or, or carbon reduction. So I I think in incentives are critical uh, when we look at this. You know I think if you think about investment, you know I, I hate to mention Solyndra. We've already moved a decade on from that, but I think it's an instructive tale where whether it's government investment in, in a very direct, intimate form like that, or whether it's through subsidies, there are real risks, not only of distortionary effects, but also of doing what basically what I would call using a rifle to bird hunt. If you have a flock of birds, you might get one. If you, but if you use a, a shotgun shell, you're a lot more likely to get the meat that you're after and that you need to sustain yourself and i think the better path to meet here are incentives that may change some of the overall parameters that players in the global energy system and energy metabolism are operating in but you do so in a way that really empowers them to use to, to respond to these incentives through ingenuity as opposed to imposing certain outcomes by fiat and choosing technological winners on the front end of a process that is going to play out for decades. And I guess what I would leave as the takeaway point there is even the most clairvoyant among us probably, you know, if we were to ask somebody in 1995 or really even 2005, if they would foresee the U.S. shale boom, and the answer would almost universally be no. And I think we have to have that same type of humble attitude and approach when we come at the energy transition as we think about policies and incentives that maybe create the best uh, operational environment. Do you have any view on what, you know, the most appropriate shotgun would be, you know, rather than a rifle? So, you know, I don't think, I, I won't give you a specific gauge of shotgun. I, I, I will share a few of the pellets that I think should be emphasized. Uh, I, I think a carbon tax and other ways of pricing carbon, I think thinking about it both uh, on the upstream side as well as in some instances closer to the point of use, I think those are some pellets that should be in there. 
you know, I think in terms of technologies that we know are in existence now and seem to be showing positive evolution, I, I think nuclear and in particular some of the small modular nuclear technologies deserve to be a pellet in the shell as well. Uh, and, you know, I think some of the existing favorites certainly should still be able to compete. Like if you're looking at wind and solar, for instance, there's a real place there. You have zero cost of fuel. You do have to think about how intermittency is handled across the grid and how you distribute the imposition of cost. But I, I think we have a lot of these positive pellets in play, but the two pellets I would definitely put right near the top of the shell uh, would be some type of carbon taxation and maybe other ways of pricing it to the extent that those emerge. Uh, thanks. That's interesting. Uh, Lee's and Deborah, I don't know if you have any views on, on that. Follow-up comments? Well, uh, one comment I would make, um, I like the pellet analogy, but, um, and nuclear I agree with. I think you know, some other actions, the government, you know, R&D is really going to be critical. So base, uh, the incentive to just do base research and development is, is going to be important, you know, in some sort of public-private kind of format, because that's what's really needed. You know, the pandemic, did, you know, everybody talks about, oh, this is really going to cause us to transition rapidly. It, it, it caused demand destruction, whether it's temporary, some of it might be permanent, but it really didn't change the progression of the technological barriers, you know, such as, you know, grid level storage, all the things that, that are standing in the way. So we need more R&D. And I would say if there's any dry powder after spending over $10 trillion in, in, uh, in you know, support payments uh, as a result of the pandemic, it, you know, I would think that we'd want to put it there. And the secondly, you know, most overlooked is uh, urban planning. I think, Gabe, you talked about vehicles. You know, that's a huge uh, consumer of fossil fuels and, and liquid fuels. We drive 3.3 trillion miles a year in the United States. Um, and so if, you know, better urban planning, you know, encouraging two-wheel transportation, and if we have two-wheel transportation adoption in places like China and India, that could have a dramatic impact. So those are some other kind of non-technical, uh, technologically dependent areas that I think get overlooked a lot. We have some questions from the audience. Uh, here's one that that is to Deborah, which kind of gets to a conversation you and I had, Deborah, before we went live. Uh, it says, Deborah mentioned cybersecurity skills are not enough, but big data must be embraced. What are her thoughts on privacy requirements? Doesn't cybersecurity, don't cybersecurity groups need to ramp up data mapping so that companies know what data they have, how long they have had it, when to dispose of the data, and generally comply with privacy statements to consumers? And I will add to that, you know, on a on an industry to industry or company to company basis, you know what you've had what you've said in your comments is really fascinating in terms of the, the chain of data and the transparency that you've indicated will be will be helpful and indeed necessary to to, to track things like uh, 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 emissions is one of the things that you mentioned. Um, however, that flow of information is usually pretty tightly controlled uh, contractually, and so what are your thoughts on? this question and also in terms of, of how industry is going to have to modify its behavior its, and its, uh, its incentives and expectations. Yeah, no, those are really big questions. I think they're um, in terms of, uh, of customer privacy. I mean, that's a great point because, you know, a lot of the bigger, you know, industry, you know, big well and gas companies haven't really thought about customers because, you know, for many, many years, you got out of the retail business. So we've been saying you've disconnected from the end customer, the user. Um, whereas, you know, on the power and utility side, they're very focused on that customer. And so they have a lot of that uh, muscle to, to be able to protect, you know, individual customer data. Um, and so cybersecurity programs in, you know, a kind of a integrated oil and gas company t tends to have focused on security like they should on their assets and, and, and so forth. And then their, their employee data and then their their B2B customer data, but I think that that's gonna be an area where they will have to ramp up to understand that. And you need that customer data, I think, 
transition to sort of these newer you know, value pools, if you will, and, and markets that are going to be smaller than, you know, I've got five off takers uh, for my LNG cargoes. You may have to go much smaller in order to get at that markets out, you know, where, where the markets are growing. So I think that's going to be critical, a skill set, and it's going to become more and more scarce. And then in terms of your question, Thomas, I mean, it's going to be difficult. There is a lot of public data. So the question is this, for example, you know, emissions data, you know, there's a lot of programs out there now um, that are sponsored as we get more sophisticated with, with surveillance, satellite imaging technologies, et cetera. So some of that may rely from a reporting transparency if we have some sort of standardized measure on, you know, that kind of third party versus, you know, uh, more confidential customer to customer transactions. Yeah, that's really interesting. And one of the one of the hot issues that's come up in the past year or so uh, uh, has been the issue of, of uh, low carbon natural gas, low carbon LNG, for example. And and one of the one of the tough nuts to crack there are is the standards, right? Um, uh, you know, what what standards do you use for measurement and and, and for and for transferring the data and, and sharing the data? Do you have any views on what you see the drivers being towards standardization? Is it is it going to be regulators? Is it going to be industry coming up with those standards? Well, I think if industry doesn't come up with it, the regulators probably will step in eventually, right? And I mean, but it's a huge challenge because, you know, it's how do you, once it goes into, you know, the a distribution system, how do you track a molecule and how do you validate that? So those mm -hmm. are, so those are some questions. So everybody sort of has to play <clears throat> and feed into it and then, you know, have some sort of allocation pool. But I, I think both the industry and the regulators are going to have, have to come together with that. And it has to be global because this is not something that, you know, stops at the border, obviously. So I think it's a huge challenge. Um, and without getting that right, it's going to be difficult to kind of get that state, that next level of stakeholder comfortable that what you are saying and the goals you're setting is actually what you're, you're achieving, regardless of how many statements you put out there. Absolutely. That's a great point. That's a great point. When Tom, just to to follow up on that question, also is I guess when you approach this from a commodity market perspective, is trying to almost independently brand as green a fungible commodity, I think is intensely difficult. And I think Deborah has you know really pointed these out, and I think we have illustrative examples from the electricity space, among other places here in the United States, when you see. Uh, how low some of the uptake rates are for optional purchases of renewable sourced electricity, for instance. And I suspect that dynamic is likely to be replicated in gas markets. It seems like something where, you know, at least from my perspective, which is, you know, somewhat different than the other speakers, is if we're trying to think about reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of natural gas uses, you know, thinking much more about carbon capture and thinking about some of these green and blue hydrogen technologies and things like that. I suspect it's a lot more impactful and you sidestep the, the fungibility challenges if you go down that road. Well, I'd like to, that's yeah, I, a great point. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Well, I was just gonna say, I actually don't think any one industry can inform. I think that we'll all have to do our best to influence. I think, it, you know, when you're adding up dollars, everybody's using the same language and, you know, or, you know, a currency. And I think that we'll see, we are seeing some, and I think we'll see further consolidation in the ratings through, you know, the agencies that just today, you know, in the investment community, here's a, here are a couple standards for credit or the, the health of a company financially. I think it's going to have to be driven that way because it, when, especially when you're talking about emissions and you go to scope two and scope three, you're adding up, you know, scope one is the only one that only belongs to you. Everything else has to be added up in multiple companies and in multiple industries equations. So I think we'll, we'll see some, some of that drive from, um, from access to capital actually. We have another question from the audience. Uh, on more than one occasion today, previous speakers mentioned energy transitions, plural, to highlight that things will look different everywhere. Can you each comment on your view of heterogeneities in the energy transition, uh, working with different consumers in different regions, each having different preferences and resource opportunities? The 
floor is open. I, I, I can go first. <laughs> By all means. Um, so, um, you know, I, I guess there would be three things that I would say. Um, I, I agree energy transitions and that it will be regionally specific. Um, and solving global challenges with regional specificity is not easy to do. Um, I, the three things I would say is that, you know, we can't take a developed world view. Um, financial capital is primarily sourced from the development world, but the spend in terms of activity, et cetera, as well as where the demand growth is coming from, as we talked about at the beginning, um, you know, is coming from countries where UN Sustainable Development Goal 13, it, it doesn't mean it's not in the list, but it may not be at the top given the sheer number of other gaps that they may have. So, you know, our approach is we have a corporate roadmap for environmental and social priorities, but we translate those actions to locally specific um, things that resonate uh, and are effective locally. You know, renewables is a good example. If there's places where the renewable cost is a lot more than, um, you know, the, the existing infrastructure, the existing cost, there may be other ways we can achieve an objective without saying, okay, renewable energy is what we're going to do everywhere. So the, the SDG lens really has worked for us. We have um, 11 focused sustainable development goals at the corporate level. And then in each of our large countries, we have two to five that they focus on, um, which have been informed through third party insight, you know, conversation with governments locally. We, we've done workshops, full day workshops in all of our large countries. And then we've mapped our technology portfolio to our six focus environmental SDGs. We've mapped our social investment programs at the corporate level to our four focus social SDGs. And it gives us a chance to be locally relevant. You know, oh, you care about this here. This is what we have in our portfolio to do that. But then we can also aggregate the story and you know track the progress um, at, at a global level. Um, the other thing I would say with kind of navigating and delivering the right global objective with regional variability has to do with emotional intelligence and you know, I, don't, I won't speak to other industries, but certainly our industry is populated with a lot of um, uh, the same DNA uh, in terms of kind of background engineering science and and that the this ability to, uh, you know, high emotional intelligence, giving sincere acknowledgement to views that you may not agree with and the right thing to do um, it can it can end up to be a very polarized discussion if you don't have emotional intelligence to manage it. So we also we have efforts in Schlumberger around leadership, um, emotional intelligence, and we've incorporated into our leadership training framework, you know, this content around managing complexity and being able to understand the land. You know, how do you talk to your stakeholders so that they feel comfortable that you're addressing it and they trust you, like you know Deborah had talked about, and then influence the land. So. Um, that's kind of what we're doing. If, if you want, I, I can give a, a double barreled response. The first part is less emotionally intelligent. So I'll start with that and then I'll, I'll, I'll give the, uh, the better version. So I, I think the less emotionally intelligent perhaps version is to look at distribution of where energy is consumed and produced. And I think that kind of brings us back in many ways to the three Titans discussion where when you have systems in you know kind of energy metabolisms on a regional basis that are the size of what we have in the united states and north america uh, which you have in in europe which you have in china and what you have in india something you have a situation there where even a one or two percentage point move against your baseline can exceed what multiple other countries might do you know, if you were to have certain technologies penetrate, for instance, or have uh, fuel slates change, for instance, the way they've changed in the United States as gas became more abundant and helped push out coal in the wake of the shale boom. So I think that's one way to think about it. But I think at the same time, both from a human perspective and a, a diplomatically sensitive perspective, is you also think about where can you make the most positive human impact and the best return on that investment. And I can tell you there's been some work we've done recently as part of our participation in the T20 uh, set of task forces that Saudi Arabia is overseeing. And there was a project I was involved with on groundwater 
in sub-Saharan Africa. And when we look empirically at the numbers there, that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum where even small investments can ha yield huge improvements in human well-being. You know, something as simple as bringing a kilowatt or two or three kilowatts of solar panels to a remote village and using those to power a water well, to power basic refrigeration and things like that. These are life transformative for people. And so I think, you know, allocating with both ends of these of this spectrum in mind is going to be something that's really important as we deal with the global patchwork that is the reality we sit in. So uh, I won't uh, repeat uh, a lot of what's been said, it's been, but, you know, to kind of borrow a phrase, um, climate change is global, but the solutions are local. And, and therefore the energy transition strategy has to be framed around that thinking. And, um, you know, the one, the, the one common element is that, you know, you, you know, uh, Buddhists say all things desire happiness. Well, all developing economies desire energy because it's the fundamental block to climbing the economic ladder. And so that's not going to change as we, as we move toward 10 billion people in the world. And those, uh, I think Gabe, you said it, are going to be resident in those countries that are going to drive the energy demand. And, and they've got a very different resource endowment. They've got a very different mix of where the population is on the economic ladder. And, you know, that economic ladder development may, may not take the same shape as it has in the OECD countries. And so we need to find more creative, but yet very energy, um, less energy intensive ways to, to really get them that same result. Uh, and, and I think that's the big challenge of all of these discussions that, that we're having. And if you think about resource endowment, I mean, um, chi China may be pivoting very hard to renewables, but also maybe nuclear. Uh, but, but you know, who's to say whether coal is ever going to come out of their stack because of the cost competitiveness of coal versus, you know, everything else that, that they can access. So I think those are some of the things that, that are going to be challenging. And instead of, you know, demonizing one set of fuels, let if we can focus on technologies that will clean it in, in, and make it the least, uh, uh, you know, Le less pollution, taking into account water scarcity, all those things as well, not just emissions. And I think that that's, that ought to be the goal, uh, keeping in mind that, you know, all these populations, they deserve the same level of opportunity, access to energy, um, a as well as their ability to climb up the economic ladder is that, is that the countries that are, you know, very, very far developed in their energy systems are. And if you have good cost effective technologies, those penetrate. I mean, think about smartphones, somebody out in rural Kenya or Sichuan province or somewhere, they don't ask which company made it or who developed the technology. They just embrace the fact that it's a force multiplier for their life. And I think when we look at all these different ways we use energy, at the risk of speaking a bit broadly, I would suspect that, you know, for all the, you know, factors that drive differences, that would be something that drives commonality. And I think kind of brings us back to why we want to really have, really be energy agnostic and have an open mind to different technologies. Well, and I would maybe just elaborate on what Deborah said, is it's framing the problem, not just as independent of what your view is as a company and your financial obligations, framing the problem, not as I want to solve energy access, or I want to solve energy transition. And instead, I want to solve energy access and energy transition. And, you know, again, like I never said, and how do I do that in a way that will be less of a footprint than I did it before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of Nick, Nick Saban football. He tells each one of his guys win the battle in front of you. And whether you love or hate uh, Alabama's football team, the last 10 years or so suggests this idea works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a question from the audience that takes a little bit different perspective, but I think is really uh, uh, in the wheelhouse of, of the presentation that Lee's gave. Uh, here it is. The, the strategic and tactical discussion of the energy transition is well outlined. Um, what are the new opportunities to participate in the energy transition from a career perspective, given that the traditional energy space is under massive consolidation? And I think, you know, Lee's in your 
presentation, you, you hit on, you know, the kind of structural issues, but also the, the, the human component that, that, that this involves. I think this is a great, kind of a great follow-up to your, yeah, to your I mean, presentation. Yeah, from, from a, a specific competency perspective, incorporating sustainability and not just environmental, it's not just an emission story, it's not just an environmental story, it's a social and environmental story. Incorporating sustainability into your competency skill set and how to leverage that in whatever your role is. Incorporating digital um, into, again, your skill set and how to leverage that. And um, the emotional intelligence. Like I said, our, our, I think our, our industry is populated with a lot of people that think in a very similar way. And the ones, you know, throughout my career, I, I joke, I, you know, I've managed to survive in that environment. I am a you know, a, a business major with a, an MBA. So I have a little bit of a different DNA than most of the people that I've worked with, but I bring something different to the conversation because of it. So I think intentionally, if you, if you sit in the, I'm more like everyone else, building up that competency because emotional intelligence is something you can learn. I think that will position you well. And then, you know, from a company perspective, I would say, going back to what I said about ESG and energy transition, there will be plenty of opportunity in oil and gas and access to capital, I believe, in the traditional oil and gas space for some companies. And if that's really what you want to do, I think in, you know, if you're in the industry already for your lifetime, there, there will be opportunity. But the, the larger companies where access to capital is and will continue to be increasingly impacted by the transition, what are you doing in that space, um, you know, those companies are going to be more likely to have uh, growth, you know, career um, runway, uh, more related kind of in the beyond oil and gas space. So, and Deborah, you you spoke about, you know, perhaps the the mismatch currently between between technologies which have been deployed perhaps but not fully implemented or, or taken advantage of, and and the skills uh, that need to be ramped up in order to take full advantage of those. Do you have any follow-on thoughts to that? Because that seems to also to, to kind of fall, that question seems to address, you know, your, your part of the presentation as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the, th we, we do a lot of surveys <laughs> being a consultant, right? But uh, one, of the, one of the surveys we did was around perceptions of the sector. And, you know, there, there is a consistent sort of negative view, um, you know, not, and some of it's very negative, but some of it is more just, hey, it's not gonna be around. You know, the, there's this perception that it's sort of a dying industry. And, you know, we all know that, as we've just all talked about, this is going to be in the system for a long time. And so how do you attract that, uh, gen, you know, um, Gen Z and, and, and then retain that millennial um, that is, is going to be, you know, bring this kind of skill set to the to the table. And I think that's going to be important to tell the story of the role energy has in the energy systems. I, I spoke at a, a, a young um, SPE conference, Roughneck Camp, or, or, and it was really interesting. There were a lot of students there and, you know, first and second year um, petroleum engineers, and they were asking that same question. I said, if you think about it, how exciting it is where we are on the cusp of a transformation. You can drive that with new innovation and adoption and new thinking um, and, you know, not thinking like uh, the prior generation, but bring that new thinking and it, and it, it can lift the world out of, of, you know, many, many negative circumstances that are around the world, that things that we take for granted. And I think that kind of resonates. So I, I think there is definitely a lot to do. Um, and it's just getting out there, telling this story and talking about um, the purpose of, of the energy system. It's not just to, you know, get fossil fuels out of the ground. It's really at the end of the day is, is you know, making sure that people have lights, somebody has a phone, they can, you know, start a small business in, in Kenya. So those are the kinds of stories that I think we need to tell this generation is because they're really looking for, you know, what is my purpose? What's the long-term uh, opportunities for this organization? It's an interesting question. Energy consumption and economic growth is being driven globally by the developing world over coming decades. This means new companies that may compete with companies based in Europe or the U.S. How do how do European or U.S. companies compete in the developing world 
um, if if emerging companies uh, may not follow the same ESG concerns and look elsewhere uh, for financing. If you want, I'm happy to take a first crack unless you want to, Lise. No, you go ahead. I'll, I'll go second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I think first of all, it is a very real possibility that you see a, a bifurcation or even further, you know, divisions and sub segments within the various global capital pools that might fund oil and gas and carbon fuel production activities. I think one of the things that we do sometimes forget when we see the latest round of, you know, ESG driven pressure by investors and in investment uh, fund managers who may be based in, you know, generally New York or London or San Francisco or somewhere like that is if you just aggregate globally some of the data that are available, it suggests that there's probably not all this capital is investable, but the size of the global pool is probably on the order of a hundred trillion dollars. And so there's a tremendous amount out there. It's not going to all be necessarily operated the same way. But if you want to operate in basins like the Permian and other premier places, you know, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, you are going to be held to, you know, somewhat different standards, perhaps. And I think, first of all, that has to just be operationalized into the corporate DNA that, you know, we can't flare all the time. We have to be careful about our methane emissions. We have to be mindful of where we source water for fracking and other other things like that that are going to uh, affect some of these metrics. And then I think, you know, the other response I would have to that question is I think we have to be careful not to automatically assume that somebody in the non-OECD world will be okay with dramatically discounted or shoddy environmental standards that, you know, even if somebody may not have quite the material you know, level of living standard that we have here, for instance, they're still very likely connected to the internet. They see what's going on in the world. And I think they're often, people are often a lot more engaged than we give them credit for. And if they see the way operations are done, for instance, in the United States and Canada and the North Sea and places like that, and they see something very different near their own backyard, I would be surprised to just see people accept that, you know, without any kind of pushback. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly second that um, we have operations you know, around the world. And I think there's certainly places in the world where a more circular economy approach is, is better than you see, a lot better than you see in, in the developed world in terms of you know, reducing waste, which ultimately has an impact on emissions as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, there was something else I was gonna say with respect to that, and I can't remember um, who was Michael's question. I apologize. Um, Yeah, I can't remember if it comes we're, to me. We're, we're, <laughs> if you think about it, let us we're know. We're at time. We're, we're just about at time. And I, I, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for this really engaging discussion. And, and uh, you know, this is the second time I've done uh, a panel discussion uh, with the Baker Institute. And I always wish we had more time. Um, but. Before we go, I, I want to ask one final question. The title of the of, of this panel is Resilience in the Energy Transition. So I'm going to, to put you guys on the spot a little bit and say, you know, given the, the unusual uh, nature of 2020, um, have, have have there been any positive effects uh, on the energy industry, uh, and particularly the, the idea of energy transition this year that you think have come up, you know, given all the dark news we've had. I'm, I'm asking for, for, for some optimism uh, uh, to close out our discussion. I'm happy to take a first stab. I would say By the danger means. in going last is that all the answers get taken, right? <laughs> well, I think ahead, mine may go. be a little different. So I'll, I'll, I'll give my very brief views. The fact that we are having to confront the issues we have today and we're having to ask 
how do we emit less because we've gotten so good at these technically complex capital intensive mining and industrial scale fuel use operations that have transformed human life over the past 250 years if we went 200 years before the industrial revolution you had a third of europe being killed by the bubonic plague and you had similar things in other parts of the world so but part of my cause for optimism is actually if you look at an arc of history over the last you know really few thousand years here i think the fact that we even have these problems that we're grappling with here and when you see the solutions we've been developing along the way to, you know, other things that got us to this spot, that that makes me intensely optimistic about the future. And, and yeah, I'm excited to try to do what little part of, you know, we might be able to to help push up all further downfield. I can go next real quick. I, I think, um, you know, there have been so many really devastating things that have have come to light uh, around the unequal impact, the impact to working women uh, that the pandemic has had. But the one thing I do take away as a silver lining, and hopefully we can we can really incorporate that, is really the the opportunity for remote work in certain areas. You know, back office where there was a lot of skepticism in 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 um, companies, and and I think that's going to create real long term flexibility for work. Um, and I think that's good. And also it reduces the carbon footprint, not having to travel, you know, that we can actually have an engaging conversation like this, maybe not ideal. And, and you do lose, you know, some of that coffee break. Well, what did you mean by that? But I think the fact that it's possible in reducing our ability, um, you know, to always be on, you know, the expectation that you need to, as a consultant, for example, you have to be, you know, on site, you know, you're traveling on Monday morning and you're back on Friday. And maybe if we can kind of make that less of a requirement and more of a need to do, I think that's a real positive and good for the environment, but really good for the workforce as well. Yeah, and I, I think building on your comments at the beginning, Deborah, about the, the global scale experiment on digital, it is a global scale experiment on the impact that consumer behavior can have on uh, on emissions, because it, ultimately it's a, it's a math equation. and creating more space mathematically allows for more space for energy access. Um, you know, you made the comment that it remains to be seen when the financial wherewithal and the, the logistic capability comes back, how much of that is in, you know, inelastic, but still much of the effort on the emission space has been focused on government and corporation up to, so it's given us a chance to see what widespread consumer behavior change can impact can have. And the other positive for me is, um, well, two, I expect there will be innovation that comes at us. Crisis spurs innovation, period, uh, because you have to. But um, is the, the increase in the, um, the social, the relevance of social in the ESG equation, I think ultimately will have a positive impact on E as well. But it's, it's probably easier to have kind of a global feeling on what can we do on the social side and, and seeing again in a negative way what the, this has had in terms of the disparate social impacts, I think will have ultimately um, positive um, impacts down the road. Well, ladies, Deborah and Gabe, thank you very much for your time. This has been a uh, a great conversation. I wish we could go longer, um, but we're, we've gone over. Uh, everybody online, uh, day two of the virtual energy event will occur Friday, October 2nd, in a couple of days at 11 a.m. Central. Uh, there will be a keynote address by Bernard McNamee, former FERC commissioner, and the, there will be another panel. Uh, that one will be on the evolution of power markets. So I would like to thank everybody for, for listening and for all the wonderful questions. I apologize we couldn't get to them all. Uh, but, um, uh, and thanks again to our panelists and thank you very much to the Baker Institute. Everybody have a great afternoon.